Welcome to Kingdom Reality, your gateway to deep insights into the truths and realities of God's kingdom. Dive deep into the teachings of esteemed teachers of God's Word as they illuminate the mysteries of Scripture, offering priceless wisdom and revelations. Our channel serves as a beacon of enlightenment, guiding seekers on a transformative journey towards understanding the essence of divine truth and purpose. Join us as we explore the depths of spiritual reality and embark on a quest for genuine understanding and spiritual growth, revealing kingdom realities. Join Apostle Oromo Sagi as he shares timeless wisdom on building personal altars. Discover the principles of prayer and devotion as Apostle. Arom delves into the significance of personal prayer altars. Through his own life experiences, he illuminates the transformative power of a dedicated prayer life. Learn how to cultivate intimacy with the divine and deepen your spiritual connection. Build your personal altar today and embark on a journey of spiritual growth and renewal. With Apostle Arom Osai's guidance, you can create a sacred space where your soul can flourish. Amen. Thy kingdom come, thy will be. Elohim Adonai. Elohim Adonai. Oh. Thy kingdom come, thy will be. Elohim Adonai. Elohim We exalt your name, we magnify you, and we ask that you grant utterance to your word, that it might come forth in simple plain language, like Jesus would have done if he were physically present teaching us, and take all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hallelujah. Can you welcome someone again to the house of God? You, you can connect. You can connect. Hallelujah. So Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them. I diligently seek him. So for the, for the stretch of this week, what we are attempting to do is how to establish a personal altar. Now the efforts of this week is tied to a statement drawn from Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. For he that Commit to God for he that cometh to God. You will find out that in the Garden of Eden, God came to man, but man had no means of going to God. Part of the reason why Adam could not access God was because at the time he did not have the life of God, he could not trade in God's unique space. He was innocent, but he was not righteous. Lacking in the life of God made it impossible for him to deal with God. So the kind of encounters that were possible in the regime of the Garden of Eden was a one-way encounter. It was God that came to man in the garden in the cool of the day. But we are seeing something here, a new addition, a new addition to the possibility. And that addition is on the account of our redemption. We now have the capacity, we now have the equipment to be able to come to God. Hallelujah. Okay. Now that we want to begin to come to God, we want to establish an altar. I would like to draw a few points to us on how to commence that adventure 
All right, let's begin from the book of Numbers, chapter 30, and I'll read verse 1 and verse 2. Are you with me? Now, we are going on a long journey, and I'd like you to pay attention. Going on a long journey. I'd like you to pay attention. Amen. Hallelujah. Numbers, chapter 30, verse number 1. And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord had commanded. Now, so what we are reading now is a direct instruction, a direct command from God. And you will come to realize as we read verse 2 that the commandment has to do with making a mark in God's realm. He said, if a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeded out of his mouth. You know, have you read that Bible, that scripture, that part of the Bible, that passage of the Bible that says, that God is not a man that he should lie. That the words of God will not return unto him void, but it will prosper. In that thing whereunto it is sent, it will bring to pass the purpose for which it was sent. That's the nature of the word of God. That's the nature of the God we serve. It's a God that is faithful, a God that means what he says, a God that says what he means. Are you there? Part of the evidence that you are beginning to mature in the ways of God is that you begin to look like God. And what part of the implication of that is that when you say something, you will not violate it. Because that's not the nature of your father. And I need to show you a particular matter here. There's a matter. How many of you still remember when I taught on how to move the hand of God. I know you don't remember what I teach you. How to move the hand of God. And I showed you scenarios in scripture where people compelled God to act on their behalf. I showed you things like the oath of silence that was used around the wall of Jericho. That people decided to keep quiet. And they walk around the wall one time they did that the second day, did that the third day, did that the fourth day, and on the seventh day, they were silent, and they walked around the wall seven times, bearing the oath of silence. When they now shouted, after keeping quiet for so many days, the wall of Jericho that was built in form of a cuboid, it fell before them and they discomfited the city. The engineers that built the wall, walls were military engineers, and the walls were built in such a manner that it is impossible for those walls to be breached. Then the instruction that led to the moving of God's hand to make an impossible situation possible required an oath of silence. Sister, is there any day you woke up and you didn't speak until the sun went down. I'm talking to you, sister. You. Was there any day in your life that you woke up and you didn't talk until the, the sun went down? You don't need to stand up. Just respond from yourself. It, it has never happened before. So there are dimensions of power that you will not be able to handle if you are not disciplined enough to. I went to my father in the Lord many years ago and I asked him, I noticed that you are one of the most sensitive Christians that I've seen. What is your secret? He said, stop talking too much. Stop talking. You Keep quiet. That he can take a trip from Zaria, where he is, to Lokoja, where he wants to go preach. And the driver knows they will not have a discussion until they arrive. So by the time he comes to the pulpit and he greets you, hallelujah, hallelujah, some angels are already at work because he, he greeted you. So I spoke about the oath of silence and uh, as a means of capturing your spiritual energy, gathering it from everywhere it is. 
so that when you now speak as you are commanded, not empty talk, not useless talk, you now speak as you are commanded, God will back it up. The second point I raised was the issue of the vow. The issue of a vow. And the one that has to do with the matter that we are raising here today is this second issue, the issue of the vow. God is saying that when you make a vow, do not withdraw your utterance. Labor to see that you fulfill it. Are you there? Uh -huh. The first thing that is required, in order for you to set up a personal altar, is a human attendant that is ready, is avowed to deal with God. He makes a commitment that he cannot withdraw to deal with God. I'm still checking my spirit to see if I should go to Leviticus chapter 27. In Leviticus chapter 27, I can produce a chart from the Bible that gives us the value when a man comes and makes a vow of himself before God. That chart gives us a value of the, the price tag or the consequence of that vow before the presence of God. So it gives us an idea to be able to evaluate the implication of that vow before the presence of God. Am I making sense? Now, so I want to show you a chart. I'm not sure I'm supposed to show you yet, but it is my intention so to do. Then if I show you this chart, I will discover that when, what's your name? Joseph. When brother Joseph comes into the presence of God and makes a vow, the, the realm of God will scan him. And then the spiritual implication of your vow will be articulated in the realm of the spirit. And the value is going to be different from the value that will be obtainable if he makes a vow. If she makes a vow. Are you there? Now, so I want to show you a chart. Maybe the chart will encourage us. Maybe the chart will give us an idea. The moment you get that idea, you'll be able to flow with me on the journey that I intend to embark upon. Let's do Leviticus chapter 27 quickly. Leviticus chapter 27, that's the last chapter of the book of Leviticus. Are you there? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When a man shall make a singular vow, the persons shall be for the Lord by thy estimation. Please stop there. Stop there. Stop there. Let me explain what we are doing here, so that you will not run into crisis. Like I said to us, we just read from the book of Leviticus chapter 27. Is that true? And if you notice, chapter 27 is the last chapter of the book of Leviticus. Is that true? And the next book, after the book of Leviticus, is the book of Numbers. Is that true? Good. I will explain the reason why I made all these statements as we journey in this matter. Something like an inventory, a census, was conducted. The object of the book of Numbers is to number the people to see how many of them have the capacity to survive the tension of war. That's the objective of the book of Numbers. Hmm? So we come to every family, we take a census, and then among the members of that family, we find out how many of them are, are, can be competent in battle. So we take that inventory and the reason for the statistics is to find out how many people in the camp of God have the capacity to bear arms 
and to contend in the face of war. Are you there? Good. Good. Having understood this, the chat above is a means through which we can understand the significance of the vows that persons make according to the estimation of what we call the shekel of the sanctuary. Stay with me, I'll explain. I know you all know that the name of the money that is used in Israel is the shekel. I know you know that. But you see, when you are coming to transact in the temple, the temple has its own currency that is not governed by central bank. The temple has its own currency and the currency that the temple uses is different from the currency that the society uses. The name of the currency in the temple is called the shekel of the sanctuary. If you take the shekel of the sanctuary to the market, it will not be able to buy anything because it's not a legal tender that is recognized in the market. It's not covered by CBN. So when you are coming to worship, and part of your worship requires money, what you are going to do is that you go to the table of the money changers, and then you will change your own normal shekel against the current exchange rate for the temple shekel. Is that clear? Are you with me? Now, so it is after you have gotten the te temple shekel on the basis of the forex trade, you can now use the temple shekel to do transactions within the environment of the temple. Exactly. Now, so you can now understand in the day of Jesus, when the activity of the money changers was now higher than the activity of the temple. You are not following me. The activity that is obtainable in the temple is what gives market to the money changers. Because people want to do temple transaction, spiritual transaction, and they need a currency to carry it out. That is what occasions the business of the money changers. That also. But unfortunately, the business of the money changers began to boom. And the activity in the temple was inversely proportional to the business of the money. <laughs> I, see, I'm provoked to say something, but not. I, I, I hold myself. I hold myself. Jesus now came and told us the reason why the temple itself was set up. He said, my house shall be called the house of prayer. For all nations, anywhere among the nations my house is found, what is about to be called? A house of prayer. But he had made it a den of thieves. It means that the principal reason for which the temple was standing was no longer relevant. What was relevant now was the table of the money changers. But I've explained to you why the table of the money changers even came into being in the first place. Did you get that? Good. Now that you got it, let us do an analysis. Verse, yeah, verse 3. Thy estimation shall be of male from 20 years old even unto 60 years old. Even thy estimation shall be 50 shekels of silver after the shekel of the sanctuary. Are you understanding that? Stay with me. Now, we need to draw a chart quickly. I hope you know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm trying to show you the implication of a vow, not according to human judgment, but according to divine judgment. They are not fully. Not according to the judgment of the shekel, but according to the judgment of the shekel of the sanctuary. That is the true value of a man's vow before the eyes of God. Are you there? See, I'm doing this just to give you a basis of evaluating 
the things you will begin to do after this lecture. Are you there? Okay. So we need to draw a chart. The first item on the chart, as you can see, is gender. Because it is either male or female. So you draw a table. Then first column here, we have draw a table. Um, then this column here is age bracket. Age bracket. And the age bracket is applicable to female and male. As you can see in this particular scripture, the age bracket is from where to where? 20 years to 60 years old. And the value for male is 50 shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. So that you will know that it is not the mundane shekel, it is the shekel of what? The sanctuary. So we have uh, age, then in that age, there is a subset there, male, female age. The age bracket in this case is 20 to 60 years. And then you now, so that's the first column. Then you have the second column here is the amount. And in this case, it is 50 shekels for male. Are you understanding the way this chart is? So the chart should have age, the chart should have male or female, the chart should have amount. So as touching um, male, it is how many shekel there? 50 shekel. Yeah? Next verse. Next verse. And if it be female, then the estimation shall be 30 shekels. So you know how to place it? 30 shekels is the estimation for the female. So we have age, which is in this case is 20 to 60 years. Then we have gender. It's either what? Male or female. Then we have what? Estimation or value. Next verse. And if it be five years old, even unto 20 years old, thy estimation shall be of male 20 shekels and of female 10 shekels. You know how to feed it into the, your chart now? Feed those values there. Next verse. And if it be from a month old, even unto five years old, that is zero to five, then thy estimation shall be of the male five shekels of silver, and for the female, thy estimation shall be three shekels of silver. Notice that this silver or this shekel is not according to the shekel of society, but according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The list or the chart before you gives us an estimation of the implication of someone's vow before the presence of God. You get it? So if I come now and I make a vow before the presence of God, my vow has a spiritual value. Did you get that? You didn't get that. If you come and you make a vow, your vow has a spiritual value and the unit of measurement of the spiritual value of your vow is the shekel of the sanctuary. Not the, not the value in the eyes of men, but the value from the perspective of the sanctuary of God. Did you understand that? Good. You know I told you in the book of Numbers, chapter 30, verse 1 and 2, that God is saying, if you make a vow, if you make a vow, and Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, this is the thing which the Lord had commanded. Yes, if a man makes, a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, 
he shall not break his wall. He shall do according to all that proceeded out of his mouth. Second scripture, First Samuel chapter 1, before we begin the journey. First Samuel chapter 1. I don't know, a financial year begins from when? Tony, you're an accountant. From which month? It begins from April. So you count from April to March next year forms a financial year. An academic year begins from when? Begins from September. So from September to when? To August. Thank you for that. For se September to August, we have an academic year. Can you see that a financial year is different from an academic year? Have you ever asked yourself how a man com commences a spiritual year, which is what we are trying to do now? The Bible says there was a man of... That's the only word in the Bible that I cannot pronounce. So any way you pronounce it is your, is your own. I'm wondering how they came up. The only name in the Bible that... I'm still trying to understand the pronunciation. That's the name. So that place, that, that name that you pronounce, that's the name I'm talking about. <laughs> this man is from Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Ziv, and Ephratite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Anna, and the name of the other, the other Penina. And Penina had children, but Anna had no children. Yes? Next verse. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And he stood. The, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, the priest of the Lord, were there. Jump to verse 21. Jump to verse 21 quickly. Because the Bible says that this man, he has a yearly practice of going to the house of the Lord. Just like you have an academic year, you have a financial year, this man has a spiritual year. And the way he commences his spiritual year is according to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 21. And the man in Cana and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord two things. One is, you are not, you are not following me. Oh, okay, you are, you are fasting. How do you commence a spiritual year? You begin with a sacrifice and a vow. Many of you come into a year and you are expecting so many great things to happen to you. Meanwhile, you have not made any commitment to God. And you are expecting to have output. A yearly sacrifice. And what? Apart from the sacrifice, you vow. And the reason for the vow is that God, oh, if you do this, I will do that. That's how to deal with God. That's how to trans transact with God. And when you make a vow based on the chart that we have seen, that your commitment to God has a spiritual value that is known in the sanctuary of God. Do you get that? It has a value. So there are two things by which you commence a spiritual year. And if you have not started those two things, the year has not begun. There's no new ground upon which you are seeking to move the hand of God. You need to go an extra mile. You know, I told you that the language that spirits understand is the dialect of sacrifice. 
So on the last day of this fast, for instance, we'll give everybody an opportunity to offer unto God a sacrifice. Now, the reason why we'll not say people that can give 10,000 people, no, that's rubbish. You yourself will decide what you are willing to give God because you want to deal with God. That's one. And then you also have the opportunity to make a vow. This vow is not a meal. I don't even need to know what you are doing. But this is how a spiritual year starts. It starts with a sacrifice and with a vow. Is that clear? Now, the vow aspect is what I'm concerned about. Because the word vow there means a commitment. And maybe your vow or your commitment, are you there? Your commitment is that I'm going to keep watches, the watches of prayer to God. And every single day in the coming year, I will keep prayer watches. And you go and look at your schedule. You do office work from 8 o'clock to this time. You do this on this to this time. If you are going to fulfill your vow, then this is the time that I'm going to be standing on my feet to fulfill my prayer watch. I, I need to tell us something quickly, quickly. Because the Bible says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him? So the measure of the Spirit of God that you see and you experience in your life, the measure of the supernatural you experience in your life is proportionate to your prayer input. Proportionate. is directly proportionate to your prayer input. A man that must advance an altar must have a vow that God, I want to deal with you. And in my dealing with you, I am going to be committed to keeping my prayer watches. The moment you come up with that decision, the regulation around that vow is that if you have come to a point where you want to engage the hand of God, by have you been touched by the message you just heard and you want to give your life to Jesus or you want to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Then say this short prayer. Lord, I admit I am a sinner. I need and want your forgiveness. I accept your death as the penalty for my sin and recognize that your mercy and grace is a gift you offer to me because of your great love, not based on anything I have done. Cleanse me and make me your child. Be faithy receive you into my heart as the Son of God and as Savior and Lord of my life. From now on, help me live for you, with you in control. In your precious name, Amen. Congratulations to you. If you have just said that prayer, you are now a child of God. Look around you for a Bible-believing church and also ask Jesus to direct you to the church where you can continue to serve Him. Consider subscribing to this channel too, so that you'll keep learning the realities of God's kingdom. God bless you.